Martha's going to make her way over here, but while she does, we have just a minute or two. I'd like to hear a praise report. You're all standing, so that makes it a little easier because you're already up. Do we have any? Well, I got a praise, and he's sitting in the back. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? He's saying that because I wasn't up there today. <laughs> no, that is a good Sunday school class. If you're not coming in to get to church in time for Sunday school, you do miss a blessing. So please, please, please come and join us in Sunday school. Anybody else? It is so good to see all your smiling faces. We're going to sing a song. It's, you can go ahead and have a seat. Unless somebody else has a praise report. We're going to sing a song we've never sung before, so you won't know if it's good or bad. No, it's a, it's a very good song. I love the message in this song. I, was, we, I, I thought about it a lot. And without, without Christ going to that cross and creating that plan of salvation, there would be no hope for you or me or any of us. This song kind of tells a little story about it paints a picture of the morning after that cruel night when our Lord and Savior was beat within inches of his life. He was spat upon. Beard was plucked out of his cheeks. I just, I start crying here and I won't be able to sing. I just can't imagine what God the Father was going through to see what his creation that he had created to praise him and his son was doing to his son. And you listen to the words of this song, Plan of Salvation. I want to thank Jesus for the plan of salvation. Just to say, Lord, I love you, for you understand. I want to be there on that great judgment morning. To touch all the nail prints in his feet and his hands. One morning at daybreak, a crowd slowly gathered. They were walking my Lord up, old Calvary's hill. So sad was the scene there That the birds hushed their singing Like a lamb he was humble To his father's own will I want to thank Jesus For the plan of salvation just to say, Lord, I love you, for you understand. I want to be there on that great judgment morning to touch all the nail prints in his feet and his hands. I want to thank Jesus. If you believe that, sing it with us. For the plan of salvation. Just, just to say, Lord, I love you. For you understand. I want to be there on that great judgment morning. 
to touch all the nail prints in his feet and his hands. To touch all the nail prints in his feet and his hands. Amen. That was a new song to us. We're going to sing an older song to us. Uh, we've sung this before and don't know that we do any better than all the new stuff. But I tell you what, it is, it is an honor and a privilege to stand up here and sing praises to God. Um, it, it truly is. Go ahead, Mitchell. forward to that day. I used to, uh, my grandma used to sit out on the porch and she'd wave that old funeral home flag or uh, fan 
And she'd say, son, son, she said, I just can't wait till the good Lord calls me home. And I used to think, Grandma, why? Why would you think that? The older I get, the more I understand that. I really do. And these, these days are changing. These, these times, they're, uh, they're not good. Um, we need to be in prayer for our leaders of our country, uh, for the leaders of the world. This world is in a terrible shape. And uh, we need to be in prayer for them. We're going to sing one more. I think the kids can go ahead and go down. And Miss Nancy will be down there in just a minute. I can't let her go yet. So there rose a lamb. One of these days, we're not going to have to worry about all this, are we? If you all would, please stand with us. You know the words to these songs, so just join in with us. Todd, would you lead us in prayer?
Take your Bibles, if you would, please, this morning and find the New Testament book of Galatians, chapter 4. When you get to Galatians, chapter 4, we'll read verse 4, and we'll use this verse, Galatians 4 and 5, as the backdrop against we say against which we will say everything God wants us to say today. Galatians 4, verse 4. But when the time had fully come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. With those words, two verses, an economy of words, the greatest theologian in all of Christian history, the Apostle Paul, tells us what Christianity is all about. If all you had from the Word of God was Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5, there's enough gospel in this to save anybody. What we have here today and what we'll preach to you today is this. The doctrine of adoption. Billy Graham's ministry spent $250,000 to come to Centralia when we were there. Churches from all across town gathered for weeks and weeks on a regular basis to pray and to plan for the crusade. Our church hosted various meetings there and I remember At one of those meetings, one lady says, isn't this great? All of these people representing all churches in town and nobody is talking about doctrine. Isn't that great? And I thought, ma'am, you are so deceived. If you don't preach doctrine, you don't preach anything. There will come a time, Paul wrote to Timothy, when men will not put up with sound doctrine, but they'll gather to themselves teachers who will say what their itching ears want to hear. The Scripture admonishes us to devote ourselves to sound doctrine. And what we have here this morning, Galatians 4, 4 and 5, is this. The context of the verses we just read, the words that Paul penned under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the context of these words is sonship. Having just written in the 26th verse of the third chapter that you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, He tells us in chapter 4 and verse 4 how that is possible. Now notice how verse 4 of Galatians 4 begins. It says, but when time had fully come. Now you may have a translation of the Bible that says this, in the fullness of time. So in the fullness of time, when time had fully come, God sent His Son. To understand this the way God wants us to understand this, we need to look back two verses at verse 2. There, speaking about an earthly son, Paul writes that the earthly son is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. Now in verse 2, 
what you have there is this. You have time set by an earthly father, verse 2, but in verse 4, you have time set by the heavenly father. Now notice what it says. But when the time, that refers to a period of preparation. When time had fully come, God sent his son. Folks, when Jesus came, and Jesus coming to do what he did for us, it was according to God's timetable. Now here's something you need to understand, though it's hard to get your mind around. With God, timing is always more important than time. Have you ever questioned, and I already know the answer to that, have you ever questioned God's timing in your life? God, you know where we are. God, why don't you intervene? God, why don't you fix this? God, when are you going to come through? Now watch this. God knows what we're going through, but so oftentimes God does not act like we want him to or even when we want him to. God works according to timing, not time. He doesn't have a clock, and he doesn't care about the calendar. Now, folks, listen. God becoming flesh and coming into this world to save us from our sins, listen to me, it's an incredible an amazing thing, but why did Jesus come when he did? Jesus coming when he did, was it because it was the right time theologically? Well, it was. Everything that had happened in the Old Testament was leading up to his coming. All of the promises and all of the prophecies of Scripture were pointing to his coming. All of the Old Testament sacrifices of sheep and lambs pointed to the Lamb of God that was going to come and take away the sins of the world. But Jesus coming to this world, did he come because it was the right time theologically? Well, yes. But perhaps when Jesus came when he did, was it the right time culturally? You see, when Jesus came, the Greek language had become common and practically universal. This would allow the good news of Jesus coming to be spread more easily because the Greek language was so common at the time. Now, so did Jesus come when he did because it was the right time theologically? perhaps. Did Jesus come when he did because it was the right time culturally? Or perhaps that did Jesus come when he did because it was the right time politically? Rome ruled the world. Rome subdued surrounding nations. And the Romans built highways like the Appian Way, which is still in use today, that would make travel and communication easier, which would allow the taking of the gospel to faraway places because of the highways that Rome had constructed. So think about this. When Jesus came, did he come because it was the right time theologically, culturally, or politically? Some might say, well, Jesus came because it was the right time religiously. You see, the Jews were a monotheistic 
people. After the Jews came out of Babylonian captivity, they were a one God people. But the Pharisees and the Jewish religious aristocracy, they had made being right with God just a bunch of rules and regulations that no one could live by and no one could uphold. So perhaps Jesus came when he did because it was the right time religiously. Let me tell you why Jesus came when he did. Because it was God's time for him to come. Jesus was born and came to this world when he did because it was time set by the Father. In the fullness of time, God sent his Son. Now think about this. I thought about this. If you and I had chosen when the Savior would come into the world, when would you have picked for him to come? Most of us probably would have picked a different time. If you look at Bible history, perhaps, why didn't he come right after Adam and Eve sinned? And before things got in such a mess, and before their sin nature was passed down and inherited, by their children and their children and so on and so forth. Why didn't God send Jesus to this world before he destroyed earth's population with a catastrophic flood? Lots of folks needed to be saved. Lots of folks needed to be reconciled to God. Lots of folks face judgment and the wrath of God. Why didn't God send Jesus then? It wasn't God's timing. You see, we might have chosen a different time for Jesus to come. Now think about this. Why didn't God send Jesus at a time like you and I live in today? with mass media, social media, the internet. If Jesus were born now, news could be spread all around the world in seconds. Am I right? His miracles could be posted on YouTube. His resurrection could have been videoed and would be more believable than an ancient record like the Bible. But the truth is this, that Jesus came into this world at the time that he did because it was God's timing. In the fullness of time, God sent his son. Now notice the next phrase. Born of a woman. Now, some commentators will say that that phrase, born of a woman, it simply refers to the humanity of Jesus. That he was born of a woman like all of us. Well, that's silly and that's simplistic. Because every person that's ever been born has been born of a woman. There's more to those words than might be derived at face value. I've told you this. Remember way back in the beginning when Adam and Eve sinned against God in the Garden of Eden and God pronounced judgment. Remember that? Judgment on man and judgment on woman and judgment on Satan. And in pronouncing judgment on Satan, what did God promise? One who would crush the head of Satan. And the one who would come who would crush Satan and the mess that he had made was said to be woman's seed. Remember that? In procreation, it is the man 
who always provides the seed. But the one to come and the one to crush the head of Satan, watch this, would be the woman's seed. So what you have in Galatians 4, 4 is this, that God's son, it doesn't say, in the fullness of time, God sent his son born of a man. You know why? Because he did not have a human father. Who's his father? God himself. Do you see this? Does it matter? Oh, come on, Mike. Lighten up. Let me tell you something. We're trying to grow you up here now. Now watch this. Then it says this. In the fullness of time, God sent his son, born, watch, of a woman, not a man, no human father. And then he says this, born under law. You know what that means? Surely you know what that means. That Jesus was a man, the God man. I cannot get my mind around that. But he was a Jewish man. Being a Jewish man, he attended synagogue on a regular basis. And like every other Jewish person, he was under the obligation to obey God's written law. Now watch. But unlike any other person that had ever lived or has ever lived since then, he lived in perfect obedience to the law of God. Now, do you know what sin is? Sin, the Bible says, is the transgression of the law. That's why we are all sinners and transgressors. But Jesus lived in perfect obedience, sinless. Perfect obedience to the law of God. Now, are you with me? But when time had fully come, God sent his son, born of woman, not born of man. God's his father. Born under law. Perfect obedience to the law. Now, look what it says in verse 5. To redeem those under the law. Now, we're church people, aren't we? We know some things about that word redeem. In fact, we sing about it. We've got songs about it. We don't sing those old ones as much as we used to, but we used to sing them. We sing them around here a little more than you sing them in other places. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeemed. Redeemed. Now notice this. The Bible says that God sent His Son to redeem. Now, redeem means to set a prisoner free by the payment of a price. Jesus came to redeem those under the law. Now, we're all under the law, obligated to obey it, but none of us do and none of us have. Therefore, as breakers of the law and transgressors of the law of God, we are sinners separated from from his holiness himself, God Almighty. So Jesus came in God's timing to redeem us, to set us free who were prisoners. Are you listening to me? He has set us free from sin's penalty. Therefore, there is now 
no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He came to set us free from sin's penalty. He came that we could be free from sin's power. Paul said in Romans chapter 12 that we were one time slaves to sin, but we're no longer slaves to sin because he has made us slaves to righteousness. Jesus came to redeem us, to set us free from sin's penalty, to set us free from sin's power. And don't you ever say the devil made me do it because if you sin, it's because you chose to do it. Each one is tempted, James 1, when by his own evil desire, he's dragged away and enticed. You sin, you did wrong because you wanted to. You chose to. C.S. Lewis said in times of yielding to temptation, and when we, and he said, it's not then that we hate God, it's then that we forget God. Now watch. While Jesus has come to set us free from sin's penalty, and Jesus has come to set us free from sin's power, so we don't have to live that sinful life and do that sinful stuff anymore. One day in heaven we will be set free from sin's presence. And if redeeming means free by the paying of a price, what was the price Jesus paid so that you could be free from sin's penalty and free from sin's power and one day free from sin's presence? What was the payment? For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you by your forefathers but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ the lamb without blemish or defect now watch God sent his son born of a woman born under law to redeem those under law. Now look at the next phrase. If you get this one right here, we better open the doors and have a spell. You all never had one. I can tell by looking at you, you never had one. <laughs> I had one on the way to church today. Now listen to me. God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem us that were under the law. Now look at the next phrase, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Now the old version of that is this, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now remember, I told you at the beginning of the sermon that the context of verses 4 and 5 is sonship. Now watch this. Jesus came so that you could be adopted by God himself into his family forever. Now watch this. The biblical doctrine of adoption is one of the most magnificent things in all the word of God. Now listen to this. Jesus said in John 14 verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. <laughs> you see it? I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Well, what's an orphan need? He needs to be adopted. And I'm not going to leave you as a spiritual orphan without a heavenly father. That's what we got here. Help yourself to this. We got a feast here. Watch, 
Without Jesus, you are a spiritual orphan. Without Jesus, we are all spiritual orphans. So Jesus came so that we could be adopted into the family of God. And to as many as received him, to them he gave the rights to be called the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Hallelujah! With what Galatians 4, 4 says, we have the full rights of sons. Sons of God. Now, wait a minute. How many sons of God are there? Jesus. No wonder Romans 8, 17 says this. We are now heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Ooh. Watch this. Ephesians 1, 5, in love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. Now listen to me. Some people may not like the idea of being adopted. I know folks who have adopted children and they will never introduce their adopted children alongside their biological children as these are my biological children and these are my adopted children. They just say, these are my children. Now watch this. If you don't like the doctrine of adoption, you don't understand it because adoption is all about grace. When we think of adoption, now listen, and if you don't hear anything else, listen to this. When we think of adoption, we think of parents adopting a sweet, precious, innocent little boy or girl. But when God chose to adopt you into his family, you weren't sweet, and you weren't precious, and you weren't innocent. Imagine that you go to adopt a child and as you meet with the social worker, you're told the child that you're adopting, first of all, is not a baby. The child that you're adopting has been in psychotherapy for most of their life. The child that you're adopting persists in setting things on fire. The child that you're adopting skins baby kittens alive. The child that you're adopting, his biological father, grandfather, great father, great grandfather, and great great grandfather, all of his family, all of his bloodline has a history of violence, of spousal abuse, and murder. All of his family died by suicide. Do you understand that every person that says no to Jesus commits spiritual suicide? This child that you're adopting, they act out sexually, but the social worker won't tell you how. They just do perverse things. Would you still want to adopt that child? Now, you know where I'm going with this, don't you? That child with all of that problem and all of those messes and all of that history, that child is you. And that child is me. Because when God chose to adopt us as his children, he wasn't adopting sweet, precious, innocent little babies. He was adopting liars and cheaters and adulterers and thieves 
that sin all kinds of sins. They think wrong all the time. They talk wrong all the time. They do wrong all the time. Now think about this. God adopted children that would cause his son to be put to death. Would you want to adopt a child that killed your perfect son? Now do you see why the doctrine of adoption is the most magnificent of things? God has chosen to adopt us into his family. Now watch this. Knowing that we are going to constantly hurt him. And we are constantly going to wrong him. And we're constantly going to embarrass him. And we're constantly going to hurt his other children and our siblings. Do you see this? Jesus came, folks, so we would not be left orphans. He came that we might receive the adoption, the full rights of son. Jesus' prayer to the Father was this. That we might understand the love of God. That God loves us as much as God loves Him. Ooh, how much does God love you? You are an heir of God. You are a co-heir with Christ. Because God made the way for you be, to be adopted into his family. You see, this whole passage here is all about sonship. And this is where it all comes down to. The son of God became the son of man. So that the sons of men could be made the sons of God. I got nothing better than that, Bill. I don't know anything better than that. Isn't that something? Well, sometimes children who've been adopted, they struggle thinking, well, my parents didn't want me. Now, folks, listen to me. When they got adopted, someone wanted them so bad that they paid a great price and went through a great deal of trouble so that they could be part of their family. Understand this, folks. God wanted you to be part of his family so much that he paid the greatest of prices. And Jesus went through the greatest of troubles so that you could be, by faith believing in Jesus, a part of God's family. I preached a funeral yesterday for a guy that's been in prison. They don't know if he was 68 or 69 years old. His own brother didn't know. He said, we know he lied about his age when he, to get his driver's license. And uh, he's probably been in prison close to 50 years total. I did his funeral. The last time I saw him alive was at Casey's gas station. 6.30 in an August morning. It had been in the upper 90s all week. And he wasn't a young man anymore. He was out for a short time. He'd get out from time to time. But he'd always go back in. I said, what are you doing out here? 
he's sitting on the tailgate of a truck waiting for some guys in the station. He said, well, we're going to roof a garage. And I said, in this heat, it was already hot, 6.30 in the morning. And he was a tough guy, you know. He said, well, if it's too rough for everybody else, it's just right for me. His buddies came out. And I'm pumping gas. And he said this. He said, see that guy right there? Pointing to me. He said he came to visit me in jail. And I told his only surviving sibling yesterday and some folks that were there, there's two reasons I wanted to visit him. I wanted to know him to know that though he's been a prisoner all of his life, that God loved him. And the word of God doesn't just declare that he was loved. The son of God demonstrated that he was loved. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I don't know what he ever did with it. I don't know. But listen to me. God wanted him all of the things he's done wrong to be adopted into his family. God wanted you with all the things you've done wrong. Some things only you know about. Nobody knows. You'd be ashamed and embarrassed for people to know how you think sometimes. What goes through your mind sometimes. Folks, oh, listen to me. But when time had fully come, God sent his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. Isn't that something? If I could sing, I'd sing. I'm so glad. I'm a part of the family of God. Washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Joint heirs with Jesus as we travel this, what is it, sod? For I'm part of the family, the family of God. Are you part of God's family? You ought to rejoice today that you are, but if you're not, that can all change today. You may have come in here today, this morning, and uh, your life and your soul, you, it's on the way to hell. But you can leave here today on your way to heaven. It's part of the family of God. If you'll turn from sin and turn to Jesus, who died in your place and paid for your sin in full and rose from the dead, you call on the living Lord Jesus. I got news for you. <laughs> he welcome you with open arms. You will be adopted into God's family. Amen? Amen? Let's stand to our feet. Father in heaven, thank you for your word today and the privilege to preach it. And I pray that it has fallen on good ground and will produce fruit, maybe even some that we get to see during this time of invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right? As our instrumentalists come and Brother Roger leads us, we're going to have a song of invitation. Here's our invitation first and foremost. If you've never from sin and turn to Jesus, you need to right now. Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. You don't know if you've got tonight. You don't know if you've got tomorrow. You've got right now, and right now you can be saved from your sins and become part of the family of God. If you turn to Jesus, you come as we sing. Those of us that have and those of us that are part of the family of God, why don't you just love on him a little bit during the invitation, all right? And thank him for adopting you into his family. Because listen to me, you weren't sweet and you weren't precious and you weren't innocent. But he adopted you as the wretched, vile, wicked sinner you are. And that's what all of us are and were. Amen? Lead us in song, Brother Roger. No one comes won't extend this very long.